we will go ahead and begin. I'm Leslie Vinjabori, Director of the U.S. and Americas Program and the Queen, Eliz Queen Elizabeth II Academy here at Chatham House. Here at Chatham House, uh, not quite here, but um, we are now fully virtual. I have to say um, it has been an extraordinary time. It's a very difficult time, but there are a few silver linings and one of them welcomes Simon Fraser, our Deputy Chair. One of them is seeing all of you um, who you know, normally in your lives wouldn't have the time to come across town, let alone across the Atlantic for one hour. And so we are taking advantage of it. And as Adam Montuz has just said, we hope never to go back, at least on that one dimension. There are plenty of dimensions uh, on which I'm sure we would all like to go back, but we will get there. Um, it's a, an important conversation. When I thought about, you know, now that we have, the, the world is our oyster in terms of reaching out to people who we would really like to hear from on the most important questions. Obviously, first is the pandemic and the health crisis, but very rapidly um, and right tied up with that is the economic implications. Um, uh, hard to think of two better people than Adam Tooze and Megan Green. Um, Adam, I have to confess that there have been a few mornings where I've woken up, read your, for example, a few days ago, foreign policy column, and, you know, not found it the easiest read. Uh, you, you write very well, and you tell a very tough story, but I am delighted that you're here on the call. For those of you who are listening, you will be able to see some of us, um, my colleagues on the U.S. and America's team, some of our panel of senior advisors, some of our distinguished guests, um, and our deputy chair. I, I'm always grateful to have everybody on the call. Adam's going to speak um, for 15 or 20 minutes, followed by Megan, and we'll open up to Q&A. We are on the record. We are actually recording this call. Um, it's your moment um, to be heard if you ask a question, to be seen if you're on visually. Adam Tooze, you will know very well, not least for his book on the uh, crash on the 2008 financial crisis, which I have to say, I didn't actually just pull out for this call. I actually use it to prop up my computer most days as well. <laughs> There's many calls, which apparently uh, Dan Dresner also does. Adam is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History. He's written many books. He writes prolifically. He has been writing very prolifically in the last month or so on the current pandemic and the economic um, response and crisis. Uh, but his work I'm sure is very well known to you. I, I highly recommend it. Um, Megan Green, um, a brilliant economist who we are very lucky to have at the Queen Elizabeth II Academy this year as our inaugural uh, Senior Academy Fellow in International Economics, Dame Deanne Julius Senior Academy Fellow, made possible by Dame Deanne Julius, who's on the call today, our former chair of Chatham House. Um, so this is, and, and I should say Megan is at Harvard now. She's not at Harvard now, she's in Boston, but she is based at the Harvard Kennedy School also as a senior fellow. So um, tremendous uh, par participants. And I'm gonna turn it right over to you, Adam, because I know that we all want to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. Is, is, the, is the audio okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I think this is perhaps my first event with Chatham House and uh, um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for your opening remarks. Um, I, I'd actually like to start with you, the very first thing you, you said that you find reading some of the things I've, I've read, I've written uh, horrifying. And, I, I, and, I, and I, I, I think this is a real issue actually. Um, there, there is in this crisis a sort of morbid, um, terrifying, uh, horrific quality. And, um, and I've constantly found myself checking myself sort of asking, you know, why are you so transfixed? Why are you so obsessed? Why has this energized you in the way that it has? Um, and I do think check against that, and it, it has practical ramifications because pessimism uh, in the economy and economic policy advice is, is, a powerful, is a powerful emotion. But I think at this point, we probably have to recognize um, that, that it's difficult to overdo the drama of the moment that we're in. History can have the job of explaining to people why whatever they take to be a current crisis is in fact something that has been repeated in the past and we've seen this all before. I think in this moment, the responsible thing to do, and I say that with this qualification, I think having really you know, kicked the tires on the car on this, I think it's fair to say that we are currently in a uniquely bad situation. Um, 
Certainly, with regard to the economic history of the world since 1945, the situation is, is worse than any, I think, that anyone can remember. Um, and I, I really don't mean this in a trivializing side of my top five worst recessions kind of a way. It, it just screams out of any data set that you look at. Um, the IMF yesterday announced that 90% of all countries in the world will see GDP contract next year. That's astonishing um, because the baseline GDP, GDP per capita contract. So it's relative to population growth. But of course, for the developing countries, that is the significant indicator of a recession. The number which has simply not left my mind all week is the announcement that in the state of Michigan, 25% of the workforce registered for unemployment in a single month. This is the industrial hub of the United States as it once was, 25% unemployment in a month. There is no period in economic history when we've seen anything like that in that shocking concentrated form. It's also an extraordinarily peculiar type of crisis because it isn't the death per se and the disruption to ordinary life that comes from the illness that is doing the damage, but it's a crisis of the second order in that it is the magnificent in some ways, gigantic policy response at the public health level around the world, literally in every country, every significant country, including a country like India, to this crisis, which is producing the economic shock. And then much of what we were dealing with in March was, if you like, a third order crisis. So you have the health, you have the epidemic, you then have the lockdown and its effects. And then what we were dealing with in March was the financial markets reacting to the expected consequences and of course financial markets anticipate. So it's also an extraordinarily complex crisis because it has this multi-layered dimension. Another way of talking about this is that the ultimate solution has to be found in the medical system before we can even start about talk. And the economic policy is not used to being conditioned in this way by fixes that have to come from outside the system. And then if you just look at the shock, uh, what is extraordinary about it is that it's extraordinarily sudden Within two months ago, America's unemployment was at record low levels. It's now heading towards record high levels. In fact, it already is at record high levels in places like Michigan. Um, it is completely comprehensive. It affects literally every economy in the world, and it hits the modern economy in its heart, which is no longer manufacturing, which is, in a sense, in a regular business cycle, the tail wagging the dog of the larger economy. It hits the service sector, which is where 80% of people in the American economy right now are actually employed. But it hits the service sector, not just in the US, it hits the service sector on the streets of Delhi. Uh, it hits the, street, the service sector on the streets of Lagos. It hits the service sector in Durban and Cape Town. We have never seen anything like this uh, before. And this in and of itself, I think, and this is something we're going to have to deal with, and this goes back to my earlier point about what is realistic here, how far are we engaging in a kind of like horror porn of economic analysis? Like, are we actually, do we have solid ground beneath our feet? That question is going to remain with us for the foreseeable future. I mean, before this crisis in 2018, 2019, one of the fashionable things for economists to discuss was radical uncertainty. This has been a theme ever since 2008. The unknown unknowns, the risks to which we can't attach probabilities. That was 2019 and what we were worrying about was Trump and the trade wars and the geopolitical contentions between China and the US. And those was concerns were serious enough in the minds of key analysts to suggest that investment was being depressed and it was that in turn which triggered the ECB and the Fed into extremely political expensive U-turns in economic policy last year faced with that uncertainty. Now think about the levels of uncertainty that we face now and why that matters is of course that you would expect adjustments in the economy itself. You would expect a permanent shift in people's savings preferences because they clearly need reserves to face this kind of crisis and you would expect a downward shift in investment demand given the huge uncertainty there are both at a macro level and in certain sectors and so this will reinforce if we were worried about secular stagnation before and we're trying to think through the consequences of that diagnosis by Larry Summers all the way back in 2013 then that becomes even more urgent now I think. Um, one of the things I'm saying and I think I would die on this hill is that inflation is not something we should be worrying about. And that has huge consequences for the second point that I want to, in this very short talk, hit on, which is not just, as it were, the historically unique quality of the shock, but the historically unique quality of the policy response to it. Because if this crisis, the economic crisis, arises out of this extraordinary uh, pandemic response, I mean, it took a while, and we will spend 
till kingdom come, arguing about the crisis response in the UK and the US. But broadly speaking, we went from not knowing about this virus in January to shutting down the world economy by the end of March. In the US, it's an, it surges from 10% lockdown in the first week of March to a 90% lockdown by the end. Um, if that was epic, epic in its global extent as well, and very unlike previous epidemics, for instance, the famous 1918-1919 flu sweeps across the history of the world in the aftermath of World War I. And if you were focused on the Versailles Peace Treaty, as I was, it, you barely noticed, except the delegates get ill, including Woodrow Wilson. It is not a matter of great politics, uh, the flu epidemic of 1819. The idea that India would shut down, which is where many of the casualties were of that, it would have been, would have struck people as absurd. Now, for Modi, of course, it's a badge of his, his status as a leader that he's willing to make those kind of decisions. And it's a legitimatory demand on a state like India that it should be able to deliver a coherent response for better or worse, of course. And can, one can second guess the calculations being made. And that radicalism of policy has continued in a dramatic way into the economic policy response to this, to this crisis. We heard Gita Gopinath of the IMF yesterday banging the drum and more power to her. Um, this is not a moment for small measures. This is not a moment for national protectionism. This is a moment to spend, to spend big, and to go on spending. And one of the real lessons, I think, for many of us out of the crisis of 2008 is put the foot on the gas. And it's easy to do that in the crisis. In a, in a foxhole, everyone's a Keynesian. Faced with a crisis, everyone wants to spend. It's an election year in the yes. So it's easy enough to build a coalition for a big stimulus. The real questions come afterwards. And that is the politics of the aftermath of this crisis, which will be huge. But if we just focus on this moment right now, what we're seeing is an absolutely unprecedented stabilizing action by the, above all, and I'll come on to this in a second, um, the leading fiscal and monetary policy actors in the world economy. And again, as a historian, I think here my job is not to say, oh, well, this is just like 08, or isn't this like the lessons we learned from the 70s? I think it's important to recognize and to emphasize and also for us to think about the astonishing scale of what is being done. And that started not in April, that started in March. And it was really in the first instance, action by the central banks delivered towards stabilizing that third order crisis. So not the epidemic itself and not the lockdown whose effects will be felt over the next couple of months, but the turbulence in the financial markets resulting from the prospect of the lockdown, which were massive. I mean, in the news flow of the second and third week of March, a lot of this got buried, but we were seeing turbulence in the stock exchange and crucially in government debt markets for gilts in the UK, for US treasuries, and even for bunts, which are very, very disturbing. Fluctuations in prices, gapping in the market that just indicated a broken system. And the central banks responded on a scale which is conventionally we say the playbook of 08. It is the playbook of 08, but it's now radically expanded. It embraces a far wider range of sectors in the, especially the market-based financial systems of the United States. And its scale is absolutely extraordinary, especially on the asset buying side. The Fed in the last couple of weeks of March was buying $90 billion of assets a day. That's $1 million a second. Uh, were being hoovered off the balance sheets of private actors. I've heard gossip on the internet of individual banks selling portfolios of 50 billion treasuries in treasuries at a single go to, to the Fed, an absolutely massive level of intervention, much more comprehensive uh, than in 08. Exempting the banks, one of the fascinating things about this crisis is that the banks have been sidelined. Expect a lot of interested talk by people like JP Morgan saying, if only we'd had bigger balance sheet capacity, the liquidity prices wouldn't have been so big. Treat that with a, a pinch of salt, or apply a liberal pinch of salt to that, I would argue. I think one of the few things to be relieved about is that we don't have to deal with a troublesome big bank, co so far anyway, which is over leveraged and has taken risks it can't manage and needs a huge politically difficult bailout. We're going to have problems enough with doing what we've done. And now we're moving into the fiscal policy stage, uh, slower than monetary policy because it's more politically complicated, but also extraordinary in its scope. Uh, we're seeing the biggest surge in public debt um, since World War II. Certainly, if you do it as if you are on pace, the rapidity of the expansion is massive. In the West, interesting questions about China we might come back to in discussion. If I have time, I'll raise them at the end. China is the dog that hasn't barked so far on monetary and fiscal stimulus. But in the West, we're seeing massive action, even at a national level in the Eurozone. And interestingly, a coupling together of fiscal and monetary policy in ways in the UK and the US, which is innovative, a real merger 
uh, fiscal and monetary policy, notably with this massive backstop by the Treasury for Fed lending to more adventurous people than they would normally lend to, taking risks. That raises a whole series of questions I'll come on to in a second. In the UK, direct monetary financing by way of the Ways and Means account. To talk about it in terms of printing money is alarmist. It evokes un very unhelpful analogies, but what that's telling you is that they are unwilling to allow stresses in the gilt market, the, the market where you issue debt to disturb the smooth flow of money into the economy. So this is a radical step to tie together fiscal and monetary policy as tightly as possible. We saw that in 08. Um, this, the action in the US is particularly dramatic in its scale, I think. So what this is pointing to um, is if you like, and I don't, I hesitate to use this, uh, this term, but it's the silver lining, if you like, in the, in the, in the secular stagnation thesis. Um, because what we are seeing is policy largely unconstrained by inflation fear. Um, what we're seeing is fiscal and monetary action, which under ordinary circumstances, if, if you showed an economist of the 1970s these data, they would be screaming about the risks of inflation. How could you be engaging in monetary financing of deficits, a huge expansion of the monetary money supply as it will appear on the central bank balance sheets without this resulting in out of control inflation? We know that that is a boogeyman. That is a monster under the bed that doesn't appear to be coming out. And frankly, right now, we would welcome 4% inflation or 5% if we could have it. It would be a good way of burning off some of the nominal overhang that we're going to have out of this crisis. Um, that's not there. And we are seeing a remarkable liberation of macroeconomic policy, which is what Gita Gopinath is argue, arguing for at the open air. But of course, uh, her, her illustrious predecessor, uh, Blanchard, uh, was the great advocate of this, of this position uh, and has been for many years. And it follows directly from the diagnosis that somebody like Larry Summers offered um, uh, back in 2013, which is that we need dramatic action uh, on the investment front um, across especially the advanced economies of the world to stimulate growth. And that lesson has been learned. So let me conclude by asking the question about what some of the, what some of the risks are here, what some of the tensions are that, might, that, we, that we should be really focused on going forward. Well, with this expansion of monetary and fiscal policy, it's clear that this is a very powerful way of putting a safety net underneath an economy in freefall right now. Again, it's very hard to exaggerate just how severe this crash is. Annualized, uh, the US economy, if you take Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan's estimates, is falling at a rate of somewhere between 25 and 30% per annum. It's not actually going to do that in the next quarter, but if we continued for a year, we would have lost a third to a quarter of output. That's like we've never seen before in recent economic history. So putting a safety net under is absolutely essential. The questions are, what are the follow-on costs? What are the side effects of doing this? And one set of very big questions are gonna be political economy questions going forward. Um, we have, as it were, bracketed, as we had to do in some ways in 08, the distributional question. Um, we do it more legitimately this time because this is not a crisis which arises principally out of the profit seeking of big banks. And we're not having to bail out the people principally responsible for the crisis. We may hate the airlines, but they did not bring this upon themselves. Um, and so the political economy of this is a little easier than that. But at the margins, nevertheless, the choices the Fed is increasingly had to make are extremely political, especially in this last round that they announced last week in response to the latest horrendous unemployment number. When you start digging into the high yield corporate bond market, you are basically feathering the nest and providing a safety net. No longer for banks. Those bankers earn tens of millions of dollars a year. You're supporting private equity, where people easily earn hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars a year. This is politically toxic in a, in a way that the Fed has not yet encountered. Um, the muni market, crucial, this is municipal debt, crucial for the, for the actual stimulus you can provide to American society because so much spending in American government is at the local level and funded through that market. But which ones do you support? Which ones don't you support? The argument has already started about the Fed's willingness to support big cities and not little cities. Which projects do you back? Fed independence was also about, as it were, removing monetary policy from the hick hack of political economy. It was about, principally in the 1970s, of course, removing it from the pressure of organized labor. It was about removing it from corporatism, corporatist entanglements, so as to allow technocratic and broadly speaking, conservative monetary policy to prevail. When you open the taps like this and go as deep in as the Fed is going, all of those issues of distribution of political economy resurge and they come quickly. And as soon as the lid is off, uh, the political system that currently, as it was stifling debate, it's gonna come back hard. The next question is, 
who is inside this envelope of massive supportive stimulus and who isn't and where are the fractures? Because <clears throat> this story I'm telling of dramatic activism is an advanced economy story. It's a story about Europe, the UK, United States, Bank of Japan. It's about those players, G7, G8 type players. It isn't a G20 story, uh, let alone a uh, UN General Assembly story. Um, and the, one of the really interesting questions is why China hasn't acted. In 2008, China was a huge flywheel on the global recovery. We've seen how dynamically the regime mobilized the Maoist infrastructure of the Chinese Communist Party to fight the virus. What we haven't seen is a dramatic stimulus, either on a fiscal or a monetary policy side. It's not that they aren't doing things, and they have prevented the worst there too. And if you go into detail, you can see the People's Bank of China twiddling all of their different instruments, but it's very undramatic, it's very low key, uh, and that in itself is significant. And I think we have to ask what kind of an act of Beijing is in this crisis. And it doesn't look like the supercharged activist power that it was in 08. And that's surprising because China is more important now and it's richer, so you'd think they might have more heft. But I think we have to recognize they're in fact also more constrained. And I would just, just bullet, bullet, bullet point. Um, they're more constrained because they've had 15 years of stimulus and the productivity of much of their investment has not been good. And so their debt to GDP ratio flatters them and they don't want to compound that problem. They know there are serious macro financial weaknesses in their banking sector. And so they don't know how much they can rely on the financial system to act as a flywheel of policy. And furthermore, and thirdly, they remember the shock of 1516. Most of the rest of us may not, but in 1516, China hit the first buffer, if you like, in its long path of economic growth. And that was very scary from Beijing's point of view. They hemorrhaged a trillion dollars in reserves, which is a huge amount even for China to absorb in exchange, foreign exchange loss. And furthermore, they know the last thing the world economy needs right now is for the Chinese currency to be sliding because that would destabilize many of the emerging markets around them. That's the last thing anyone needs. So in a sense, we could be perhaps relieved that Beijing has proceeded as cautiously as it does. But if Beijing does not put its foot on the stimulus accelerator in the next month or two, that is a very bad sign for many of the emerging markets. And in fact, places like Australia as well, which are crucially dependent on China for their growth. Even more severe, is of course the position of the uh, more fragile emerging markets, uh, the weaker members of the G20 and the larger group of significant emerging markets around them, not even to speak of lower income countries, what investors like to call frontier markets. They have experienced the shock uh, in the last two or three months, which is without parallel in recent history. Uh, we are looking at the largest, not, and it's important to say this, not that emerging markets haven't had a very rough time recently. Since 2013, really, it's not been a bed of roses. One national crisis after another in key areas. But the massive synchronization of this and the fact that it's happening in the advanced economies at the same time gives this an absolutely unique quality because there's nowhere to go. There's no external source of demand and capital is pulling out of the emerging markets at the same time. 90 plus members um, of the IMF have applied for support. This is completely unprecedented in terms of the... Of the, of the rush uh, of, of more fragile members of the global financial system. And, and I, I read the news, I was up to date on the news until 8.30 a.m. this morning, so I don't know what's happened in the last hour and a half, but at 8.30 a.m. this morning, the story was that America, the Trump administration, is not playing ball on the efforts to engineer a collective G20 IMF World Bank support program. There are people on this call who can give us much more details about that, but that is a crucial challenge. And in this case, this isn't a question of charity. This isn't a question of sort of aspirations to global governance. Um, this is a matter also of the sheer viability of virus suppression, because we know it has to be done comprehensively and it has to be done with the power of, a, of, of, of amply uh, funded measures behind it. Without that, we simply can't get a grip on this virus and we can't restore globalization. I will end there with just one final sentence. And on top of all of this, the virus has found the weak point in the Eurozone. And, and with, a, with, a, with a truly vicious sort of uh, twist of fate, uh, the country that was hit first was Italy. You could think of some complicated structural reasons why that might be the case, but it is a fatal, as it were, shock to the Eurozone, unless um, the response over the next couple of months becomes more serious. I don't mean fatal in the simple sense it'll blow up by the end of the year. I'm, I'm not in the business of making those kind of Anglophone Eurozone doom predictions. But in terms of the political logic of the zone, above all, this is a, this is a moment for action. And Berlin and the Netherlands have refused to take that action. And it's quite difficult to row back from the position that they're currently in and quite difficult to see a path forward. There is a big meeting on the 20th, 23rd coming up 
There is a timetable for a more generous response by the summer. Um, but those I would see as the four weak points. The political economy of the massive response we have seen. China is a big question mark, a huge fact for the rest of the world. The astonishing shock to the emerging markets and low-income countries, which is unprecedented in history. And within the advanced economy world, the fragility of the Eurozone as a key fault line uh, inherited from both in political and economic terms from the crisis of 2008 and its aftermath. Thank you for your, your patience. That's great, Adam. Uh, quite, um, quite a lot in that. And I know from following you on Twitter and reading your writings that you do have a lot of thoughts on the emerging markets, but we'll, we'll turn right over to you, Megan. Okay, thanks. Um, let me try to respond to some of what, uh, what Adam said and then fill in some holes along the way. Um, first of all, Adam mentioned that the most pessimistic economic growth figures for the U.S. for the second quarter annualized are around negative 34 to negative 40 percent. Um, the range, however, is from, uh, according to the Bloomberg um, survey of, of consensus, it's, it's negative 0.6 percent, and I, I would love some of what they're on, um, to negative 40 percent. So uh, we've never seen such a huge range in forecasts, and that's partly because we just don't have that much data that incorporates the um, impact of, of putting the economy on ice. So it's starting to come out. Today we got retail sales in the US and the Empire Manufacturing Index. Um, and they both suggest that the engines have completely fallen off the plane. Um, so we're seeing what happens when a full speed economy runs into a wall and now the body bags are just starting to line up in terms of economic indicators. So. I can't stress enough how much the economy is absolutely on quicksand. We don't know where the bottom is yet. Um, we know we haven't gotten there, but we, we can't even see where it is. Um, so these are really extraordinary times. Um, I would agree with Adam that the policy response has been difficult to overstate. It's been huge. Um, central banks uh, were absolutely the first to intervene. The, the Fed is, has thrown the entire kitchen sink at this and every other gadget they could find in the kitchen. The fact that they're buying a municipal debt and corporate debt now, you know, a, a couple months ago, I, I suggested maybe buying corporate bonds would be another tool in their kit. And, you know, Fed officials looked at me like I had 40 heads. Um, now, all of a sudden, it's something that they're already doing. So, the um, distance that the Fed in particular has moved in a short period of time is huge. Um, the ECB has been a little bit less impressive, though they've done a lot as well. Um, the fiscal response, though, uh, has um, also been impressive, but just isn't big enough. And that goes for um, the U.S. and the Eurozone in particular. In the U.S., um, and in the UK, I think there's been this weird bifurcated response where there's been a panicked, all hands on deck approach to economic policy and a pretty relaxed response on the health policy front. And as Adam highlighted, you can't address, you can't find the bottom of this until you actually deal with the health policy front. So in the US, in a $2.2 trillion package, only about $150 billion was mm -hmm. allocated towards the actual health policy side. And that's completely backwards. Um, even the economic policy measures are too slow and too small. So, um, you know, checks being mailed to people, um, they've, they've been held up because Donald Trump wants his name on them, actually. Um, but, you know, people have lost their jobs in the meantime. They need to make rent payments, buy food. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just taking too long for small business loans um, to encourage small businesses to keep uh, workers on their payroll. Um, that rollout has been pretty slow and it's already largely subscribed. So what we're seeing now is that a $2.2 trillion package was huge. It was impressive that politicians got it together so quickly, but it's just not big enough and it hasn't really been fast enough. The idea has been to put the economy on ice for roughly two months. Um, so that when we contain the virus, we can defrost the economy and ramp right back up. Um, I think we're realizing now that two months is probably not long enough and that we're probably not going to ramp right back up. So in terms of the shape of the recovery, once we do finally figure out where the bottom is, most economists that really hope we have a V-shaped uh, recovery, that, that's just not on the cards at all. But a lot does depend on epidemiology, and I'd say the most likely way forward is that uh, they've shut us all down. They're going to let us all out until the number of cases surges again, and then they're going to shut us down again until the number of cases falls. And we're just going to wash, rinse, repeat on that cycle. So unfortunately, my base case scenario is that we'll end up with kind of intermittent isolation. So freezing the economy, defrosting it a bit, freezing it again. And that doesn't lend itself to a V-shaped recovery where we just get right back to business. Um, that is not the best option I'd highlight. Uh, there's a much better, less costly option, which is just to test 
everyone roughly every two weeks. It's the proposal put forward by Paul Romer. Um, the reality is that we'd have to test 150 million people in the U.S. every day, and we can't even test 1 million people in the U.S. every day at the moment. So I just don't think we have the logistics, uh, the resources, or the politics behind that at the moment. But in a couple months from now, maybe that's what we'll get. And in, in that case, then we can let people out and we can let business um, resume. Um, but you can't really open up the economy by diktat anyhow. Um, so even if a governor or a president or a prime minister said, go ahead, go to the office, go to restaurants, I'm not sure people are really going to do that. I think it has to first start with consumer confidence, and we're just a really long way from having that at this point. So, um, you know, a fundamental view in just reopening the economy is that we'll let people out um, so, so that some of them can get sick, so that they can get immunity, and then we'll have herd immunity. But uh, I, for one, am, am not willing to be a team player on that front. If you told me to go out and get sick, <laughs> and then we'll all be better, I'd, I'd just say no thank you. Um, so. I think a V-shaped recovery is really unlikely. We're probably looking at more of a Nike swoosh with a zigzag on the back end as we have intermittent isolation. Um, I would also say a V-shaped recovery requires kind of a coordinated global recovery. And Adam mentioned that emerging markets account for about 60% of global, global GDP. The emerging markets have really been hit, hit by the financial markets uh, as the US dollar has strengthened that's made their sovereign debt that's denominated in U.S. dollars much harder to service. It's made imports, invoices in U.S. dollars much harder to pay for. Um, there have been massive capital outflows from emerging markets, the biggest that we've ever seen in March, according to the IIF. And so the financial side has hit the emerging markets. But has the virus actually hit emerging markets yet? And there I would say it hasn't hit emerging markets in the same force that it has the US and Europe. Um, and emerging markets and frontier markets um, don't have the health services to withstand um, a surge in new cases in the same way that some of the developed markets do. And so even if we were to start opening up our economies in Europe and the US, um, it, it would probably come at a time when emerging markets are feeling a full force of this virus, um, not just financially, but in terms of health terms as well. In which case, you know, where would our demand really be coming from? It's certainly not going to be from EM. And that just means this will be an uncoordinated uh, recovery, um, which makes sense given we haven't had much of a globally coordinated response. And I think that is a huge shame. The IMF meetings are happening right now. This would be an opportunity to try to negotiate some kind of globally coordinated response. The G20 is another opportunity. It seems like, seems like the U.S. above all else is not playing ball. Um, and so that's unlikely to happen. Um, now, this kind of go it alone, every nation for itself approach, I think is that we've been seeing for the past couple of years, um, not just in the US, but across developed markets. I think that's just being accelerated by this virus, but I think a lot of other things are being accelerated by the virus as well. So inequality, Adam mentioned, um, you know, we're basically supporting private equity. Um, that's gonna exacerbate inequality as the 1% get even richer. And of course, service workers, hourly service workers are on the front lines of this. They were the first to lose their jobs. They're 80% of our economy. Um, they're the most vulnerable and they've been hit the hardest. Um, so that really hurts at the bottom end of the pay scale as well. On top of that, you know, one thing driving income inequality has been market concentration. And I look out my window, sadly, at, at all these little shops, independent shops across the way. Then they're all shuttered now. Are they going to be replaced by new independent shops when we finally get back to normal? Um, that seems unlikely. It seems like the big companies who have access to capital markets will probably come in and take that space. So I think that market concentration will probably just increase off the back of this, and that will exacerbate income inequality as well. Um, now, along with nationalism, I think we'll see a, a fall in physical globalization as we bring supply chains back on shore. Um, and as, as you know, top-down initiatives um, increasingly turn towards uh, nationalism. But I actually think that it will just be replaced by a different kind of globalization, which is digital globalization. So Adam had been saying earlier, he hopes this never changes. And that, you know, I imagine a lot of us will have fewer in-person meetings and more Zoom meetings going forward. Um, so I do think that we'll discover that, you know, for a lot of us, we don't actually have to be in our offices to do our jobs. In fact, we don't have to be in big cities to do our jobs or in the U.S. at all. And so I think this will accelerate digital globalization, which could have happened. We've had the technology for a while, um, but now we all realize that, that we can do this. 
Um, one thing I will say, Adam, I agree with you that we should all die on this hill that inflation is not going to be a problem. But I do think we'll get inflation off the back of this. Um, when the dust is settled, and for good reasons, actually, I think we'll get inflation because we're all learning how to continue to be productive with fewer resources. And so when the dust is settled and we finally get demand again, I think we will be more productive. We'll get a productivity boost, which we haven't seen really um, in the past at least a decade. Um, we've had frustratingly low productivity growth. And if we get a boost to productivity, then that should actually feed through into higher wages and higher inflation, and that's great. That being said, I don't think we need to worry about it. I think every, every central bank would be pretty psyched to see inflation above their targets for a while because they've, for the most part, been well below their targets um, for a long time. We're going to have a world in which there's much more debt. Um, often governments try to deal with that after ma massive um, crises or wars by increasing taxes. I think we can probably expect that. Um, that could open the door towards a digital tax or towards a carbon tax, which you know have been on the table already, but this might accelerate that as well. Generally, I think governments are gonna try to grab um, any tax revenues that they can after this. Um, and so we can expect that. And I think we're gonna have a bigger role for the government generally. So. You know, a month ago, if you said that there would be a discussion about having an app for all of us whereby we scan our way into things and the government knows who's been tested positively for COVID-19 and who hasn't and it gets reported automatically and you can look up this app and see where you are relative to other cases, um, you know, we, will, we would have all said there's absolutely no way. And I still think that there's really no way. That's probably not going to be our approach in the West, at least. But the fact that it's on the table and being discussed already already marks the huge shift in our um, thinking. And I think it's representative of us all believing that the government, you know, it's stepping in to fund a lot of things now. And it's just going to have a bigger role in our economy and our lives going forward. Uh, I'll finish there. Thank you. Um, that was that was great. I have to say, if the inequality in terms of the fiscal uh, support is as deep as you suggest it is, it is and will continue to be, then it's a very good thing that Donald Trump, for Donald Trump, that he's putting his name on the checks that are going out to Americans because that that's the game that he's been trying to play for some time now, and now you know. <laughs> The stakes are much higher and the gap is going to be much bigger. I have a question, but I don't want you to answer it until I take a couple of others. But I will just add one, which is, I guess, it's, it's the political economy question, um, and, but it's also a, a, a sort of a question about ideas. And it is, at what point do, does the political economy debate become the debate? At what point does it drive the wedge between uh, and, you know, erode the consensus that we're seeing in terms of, of course, there are debates about, you know, oversight for bailout of, of certain sectors, but when does the political economy become the big one? What does it focus on? And especially actually amongst the elite economists and those um, both academic, but also, you know, driving the policy debate, what are the main lines of debate going to be in the economic response? And, um, what are the divides going to be and when are they going to emerge is something that I'm very, because that, that's when it's going to get really difficult. And, it, and I assume it's going to come before too long, but I'm curious what that looks like. But before you answer that, um, let me come to, and here, uh, if you, same as we always do when we had bricks and mortar to play around with, if you say who you are, if you tell us your institutional affiliation and anything else that's relevant to this conversation, um, but please use the raised hand function, or if you can't figure that out, just raise your hand, but use the raised hand function or the chat function to indicate that you have a question. So I see, um, I see one here from Ron Freeman. Ron, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute and give us your question. And uh, then Matthew Goodwin, we'll take those two. Uh, Leslie, the, my question really is uh, the link between the health crisis and the economic crisis that uh, our speakers were so eloquent on. Let's imagine that we've uh, grossly overestimated the lethality or the contagiousness of the virus. If uh, through technological or just uh, medical sensor, uh, census, we find out that the contagiousness is much less than we thought, to what degree would Adam's uh, gloomy assessment uh, would he modify his gloomy assessment? 
Okay, and, and Matt Goodwin, and, and Ron, you didn't say who you are, but um, I'll let you get away with it. Ron is a tremendous uh, intellectual and supporter in every dimension of the US and America's program and Chatham House. Um, Matt Goodwin? Uh, yeah, hi, um, I'm a, a professor at uh, University of Kent and associate fellow at Chatham House. Um, uh, so my, my question is actually the, I suppose, the opposite to Ron, which is, well, well what if we, I have not overestimated it, but what if we've underestimated the scale of the current crisis? And I think already you can see that the initial V-shape recovery uh, expectations have already proven to be, I think, quite inaccurate. And with an eye in particular on, on how this is playing out in, in the Eurozone, where I think there's a good case to be made that this crisis is going to exacerbate some of the existing divides crudely put between, between North and South, what could actually now be done over the next you know, three months to try and mitigate the worst effects of that growing divergence uh, between North and South? What practically can be done, if, in particular with an eye at the crunch meetings coming up at the end of this month, just to try and foster a greater sense of uh, um, uh, unity within, within Europe? Thank you. I'm going to let you both take those two before we come back to a question from Olivier and I think Mark and maybe Simon, I'm not sure who else is on the list. Um, if you go ahead, um, Adam, do you want to go first? Um, those, are all, those are all really, really profound questions, unsurprisingly, um, from this audience. Um, I mean, I think, I think, uh, this question of when the political economy comes to, to dominate the agenda is a, is a really fascinating one, also for a historian, if you think about the comparison with 08 and how rapidly the, you know, uh, how extraordinarily intense the debate became around TARP um, to the point where, you know, the first round was voted down. And we haven't, we haven't seen anything even remotely like that in this time round. And it, it leaves me wondering what the political, as it were, the, the backdrop for that is. I mean, one of the things, of course, has happened is that Bernie Sanders' campaign has collapsed, so the energy has gone out of the left wing of the Democratic Party to a remarkable extent. Extraordinary, significant political development, which, which, which sort of disappeared in the wash of the news flow almost, which I think has quite significant implications going forward. And of course, the other the other alignment that's crucial is that the GOP is on side, broadly speaking, with this president in a way that the GOP wasn't with the Bush presidency at its final stages, where the politics suggested that you distance yourself. And, and I think that's crucial to understanding how, I mean, that may be excessively cynical, perhaps, but I think that's crucial to understanding how inflamed this, this is likely to get in the short run. In the longer run, I, I agree with Megan and the, and the gist of, of, of this question is that I do think these political economy questions are going to come back to haunt us acutely and, and precisely for the reasons that Megan cited, which is that, that this crisis strikes at the, some of the deepest fault lines in American society, the entanglement between, on the one end of the social spectrum, precarious labor market conditions and health insurance, frankly, at, at one end, uh, and we're seeing also massive racial uh, divides opening up in the mortality numbers of the disease. And at the other end, as it were, the way in which the dominance of superstar firms is going to be reinforced. And I don't think it's necessarily even, as it were, a matter of choice. One shouldn't think of this too conspiratorially. It's not quite the same as the big bailouts for the banks were in 7, 8, 7, 8 where there really were folks sitting around in rooms fixing deals. This... I'm not denying that those kind of conversations are going on right now, but this structural advantage that large firms have in coping with a crisis like this is, is going to do a huge amount of damage and further exacerbate the, the inequality. So I, I expect the question not to go away as to calling the timing. I think it's probably a matter of, of, of timing. Um, and I'm sure Megan has a deeper insight into the workings of the uh, academic economics. Uh, than I do um, to be able to call, as it were, when the key paper by which group of research is going, is going to arrive to, as it were, trigger that debate within the intellectual scene. Let me take the, let me take the Eurozone question, um, um, as it were, the, of our two options, uh, rather than underestimating, uh, rather than overestimating the risk, what if we, what if we underestimated the shock uh, and, and how will the Eurozone cope? I mean, I, I, it's not news, I, I've, I've already indicated it, and everyone here will know that the first round of that conversation has gone about as badly as it could possibly have gone. I, I'm a, I'm a card-carrying member of the Corona Bond Club, 
Um, but the question, of course, that historians will ask is um, whether or not it was wise on the part of the French in particular to lead that push. And if they made the calculation that that was the moment to go, what was their plan B? Because they, it's difficult for me to believe that they expected that Netherlands and the Germans to simply roll over and say, yes, what a great idea. Let's use this crisis to overcome our longstanding objections to the euro bonds and vault into an era of uh, more uh, extensive federalization of risk. I mean, and if Paris did, presumably did not expect uh, the initiative to be accepted, what is the game plan um, from here on forward? I personally would favor a coalition of the willing around the group of nine, but people that I know who know French political economy better than I do say, Adam, that's crazy because the entire point of French strategy in the Eurozone is to be in align themselves with Germany. So if they ended up in a coalition of willing with the Italians and the Spanish backing, as it were, the issuance of a mini Euro bond, a mini Corona bond, that would negate the entire logic of French policy. I do think that's a test of how serious the French are about this. And in the last Eurogroup meeting, it sounds as though Le Maire drifted back into a comfortable modus vivendi with Olaf Scholz. The two of them apparently are close and get along well, which doesn't suggest that that confrontational line is the way the French are going to go. Barring, you know, serious institutional moves, I think this comes down to what we've seen so far, which is very large action at the national level. Even the Italian and the Spanish programs are large. They're not large enough, and they're not as large as the German program, but they're considerable. Um, and all of this supported by the ECB. I mean, the, one of the reasons for the inaction on the political side in Europe is that they found the fairy godmother. They found, they found the, the, the mechanism which neutralizes the effects of their inability to agree politically, which is simply large scale bond buying by the ECB. Um, the problem of course, is that that's illegitimate because it's considered to be basically a furtive, a, a stealth form of risk transfer and de facto it is, though that may not be its primary purpose. Its main primary purpose, as Pisani Ferry and Blanchard pointed out, maybe being in a good equilibrium rather than the bad equilibrium. Um, but de facto it results in risk transfer and conservatives in the North will call that bluff and they will use the German constitutional court to try and call that bluff. And then the German constitutional court is not going to sabotage Berlin's Euro policy. So the German constitutional court becomes delegitimated as well because it passes a series of what are essentially political judgments so as to enable the ECB to continue doing what the Eurozone needs for stability, which is to act like a regular central bank. And um, my kind of my base case scenario if, in terms of you know the language of forecasters would be that that kind of improvisation continues i mean it for the long term for the, even the medium term i think very unpromising as a vista for eurozone development i don't expect the wheels to come off the bus i don't think we're in a 2011 moment here because the ecb seems to be all in but i'm not optimistic about the path and the trajectory of eurozone development going forward on that basis Megan. Yeah, I'll just add quickly, um, in terms of the lines in the debate coming up, it'll be around spending money, and we haven't seen it yet. But as Adam pointed out, 2008, 2009 really looms large for a lot of these policymakers. And I've criticized the fiscal response for being too slow, even though it was really quick. But the reason it was too slow is because everyone's terrified of having another TARP 1 vote and having it fail. Um, I mean, the absolute bottom would have fallen out of the markets more than it already had. So I do think that we're finding that, you know, there's a, a need to find at least a consensus around these things before they go for a vote. I also know from my colleagues at Harvard who were instrumental in developing the response to the 2008-2009 um, crisis, uh, such as Jason Furman, that, you know, they immediately had to face political discontent. So they passed a package thinking, we'll just get this done and then we'll move on to the next one. And that seems smart at the time. And that's what I and others have actually been calling for Congress to do now. But actually then they found that there wasn't much political capital left with, for subsequent rounds. And so um, I do think that that's a concern already. Congress is working on a fourth package, but you know, when will um, the political support for this run out? I think as long as we continue to see the kinds of economic indicators that we're seeing come out now um, we'll have political support for spending money for this um, regardless. Also, we're in an election year, which I do think um, suggests that the president will be behind, be behind spending money to support markets, if, if not the economy. And so Republicans have shown that they'll just line right up 
behind Trump if he supports a bill. Um, and so I, I think that support will last longer this time than it did in 2008, 2009. Um, the question, you know, is what if this isn't as lethal as we thought it was? Um, I think the real constraint there is the number of open beds in ICU units and the number of ventilators. And there we've already actually run up to the boundaries in a lot of different states. And so I think this is as lethal as we, we worried. But, um, but your question is a valid one and also suggests how much we just don't know about this virus. Um, we also don't know much about its immunity. So the whole idea that we'll get a vaccine and then we'll have herd immunity, that's tough if we don't know that people are actually immune after they've gotten this or um, how immune they are. Uh, it could be strong, it could be weak. We don't know that yet. And so that makes herd immunity and trying to develop it as a tool to get through this um, pretty dicey and, and very risky. On the Eurozone, I agree with Adam entirely. The ECB is going to have to hold the bag on this one again, unfortunately. Um, the Europeans were never great at fiscal coordination and they're, they're showing their colors. Um, again, the one thing that we could see done conceivably um, in, an, in economic terms at the next EU summit is having the heads of state say, look, we'll just provide ESM lending and the only conditionality is that you have to use it for coronavirus related stuff. And then countries could be eligible for an OMT program from the ECB with the condition being you just need to use it for, for coronavirus related stuff. Um, the Dutch and the Germans have shown politically that they're not really willing to sign up for that. And the Italians have shown that they're not really willing to give up their sovereignty for you know, an envelope that's up to 2% of GDP, that's not a whole lot um, for a whole bunch of conditions. So uh, unfortunately, politically, I don't think much is feasible by the next EU council. I think pretty much the ECB is gonna have to step in with much more bond buying than they've already announced. And also with these Teltros that they're offering, um, basically they're paying banks to lend into the real economy. And they've, um, they've started to play with that a bit. And I think they'll have to do a lot more to subsidize the banks to get real loans out to the real economy. Beginning to look a little Chinese, the People's Bank of China seems to be doing similar kind of techie manipulation of the interest rate structure to see whether the Chinese banks won't step into the space. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm going to come out to a few more people and also read out a question from Olivier Lemaire. Do we have to accept, uh, expect CBs, central bank's balance sheets, to remain huge for a very long time, and does it matter? Um, we've got um, Keith Burnett, Dame Dan, Julius, Ritula Shaw, and Mark Malik Brown. So I actually think, given the time, I will take them together. Um, Keith, did you want to go first? Are you there? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to Keith and we'll go to uh, Dan. Um, oh, are you there, Keith? Yeah, sorry, Leslie. I was just, I was really interested in the, the point um, that Matt raised um, because I think that that's, I, I know we've touched on it, but I th I, that, that, was, that was really my, um, that, would, that would have been a question along my lines because as, as the days go on, it feels that um, we are uh, increasingly discovering more and more and more problems. So that was really my point. Okay, and as you can see, my colleagues at Chatham House are violating the rule, which is to introduce themselves, but Keith Burnett is a very important member of our executive team. Um, Deanne. Thanks, Leslie. Um, yeah, Deanne Julius, I'm now connected again with Chatham House, but formerly with Bank of England on the MPC. My question or my comment really is about policy sequencing because this discussion today has really focused on the fact that we are indeed still going downhill uh, in, in economic terms. Uh, but the, the assumption seems to be that this is going to go along for a long, long time. Whereas actually, I think we, a more likely scenario is to recognize that the health aspects of this will be temporary. They might be long, longer term than one would like, but we, we are in a situation where a lot of these uh, known unknowns are going to be, uh, if not completely known, at least better known uh, within the space of a month or two. Uh, there's a lot of progress happening on the health front in, in diagnostics and treatments, uh, less so in vaccines yet. Um, the experience in China seems to be relatively um, positive as they gradually come out of their lockdown. And I think the that indicates to me at least uh, that the policy sequencing should be more or less what it has been so far. That is very quick on the monetary side. Uh, 
uh, try to stabilize financial markets as quickly and as, and as massively as possible. And I think that's being done. Uh, on, the, on the fiscal side though, we really don't have good micro data or comparative data with other countries to know whether the best approach is indeed to use existing policy tools like unemployment compensation, which I understand in the US is actually reasonably generous the way it's being topped up or in, our, in, in Germany, whether it's better to, uh, to try to uh, lead companies to go into part-time working as opposed to here where it's furloughing. I mean, there are all kinds of micro questions that we're learning more and more about. And so it seems to me that from a fiscal point of view, we don't actually want to throw everything we've got straight, up, straight away. Uh, we actually want to mod modify policy as we go along. Uh, and I just wonder whether we're being a little bit too uh, uh, apocalyptic, thinking that everything has got to be sorted out at the moment. Thank you. I'm going to come to Ritula Shaw next. I would also add on Deanne's comment that, of course, it, given you know the starting point for America's unemployment and that you know the, the lack of capacity at the national level, having that kind of response and having it stay in place um, uh, post crisis could be uh, very important. Whereas that's not the same problem in other in other parts of the world. Deanne. Um, Rutula, are you um are you with I'm, us? I am. I'm here. Hello, I'm Rutula Shah, BBC Radio. Um, I'm wondering whether it matters. You talked about the central banks leading the charge, but does it matter that there is a more coordinated political global leadership response, such as you saw in 2008, 2009? Is this another aspect of of perhaps a more fragmented, deglobalized world that may emerge at the end of this? Does it matter, or is it enough for the central banks to? to charge forward and, and to, to lead the response to this. I think that's a, a perfect segue to Mark uh, Malik Brown. Hi, um, and I'll be very quick because I know we're running out of time. Um, I'm on the uh, new advisory board to the managing director of the IMF, but in my day work, do a, a lot in emerging markets, both on the board of commercial and not-for-profit organizations. And obviously, they've had the reverse sequence, deserted by the financial markets, now hit the real economy. The health impact is about to come, but hasn't come. We have the World Bank IMF meetings at the end of the week, as has been referred to. Is this any prospects for Ritula's question to be answered there of some perspective global cooperation, the key point um, would probably be a huge issuance of SDRs would be the way to show there was real uh, global action. Uh, as Adam said at the beginning, it doesn't look likely this week, but there are an awful lot of people, and uh, former leaders and others, pressing for it. Do either of you want to put odds on it? Okay, I think we will also, that's a lot of questions. I, I think we've got them all. I'm gonna allow you to answer as you like um, and use this also for your final comments. Megan, why don't you come first? Can you hear me, Megan? Yeah, sorry, I'm just trying to unmute. Um, so the question, are central bank balance sheets gonna be huge forever? Yes, um, I think central banks are gonna end up monetizing a lot of this debt. We just won't call it that because that's illegal. But. Um, I think, you know, the UK step in just having the central bank hand money over to the treasury, that's probably the way forward, um, whether they do it overtly or not. Um, does it matter? No, not really. I, I don't think, other than for political reasons, for economic reasons, it doesn't matter. Central banks are certainly worried about their own independence. Um, if they have massive balance sheets and are sitting on tons of government debt, um, and that's the reason that central banks or that the Fed was trying to shrink its balance sheet previously. I think it's the only valid reason was uh, political, not economic or financial. Um, on the fiscal side, uh, I think you're right, Deanne, that the health crisis will pass at some point. Um, but I think in terms of the scale of the collapse in the economy and the quite intentional one, right, this was a policy choice. Uh, having all hands on deck uh, in terms of a policy response, I think is appropriate here. Um, small businesses in the US, for example, they're gonna need a lot more money. If, if the point is to keep the lights on until we get to the other side of this health crisis. And so if, if that's what we're trying to do, I, I do think we're gonna need a lot more money and, and shouldn't be hesitant in distributing it. Um, 
do we need a coordinated response? Definitely. This is the very definition of both an exogenous shock for the whole world and a global crisis. A coordinated response is absolutely a, a first best option. Um, in the absence of that, uh, and we haven't seen that we're going to get a coordinated global response, central banks stepping in is, is the second best option only. I will say that the Peterson Institute just put out a, a, a free ebook on um, what a coordinated global response could look at through different organizations. I think there's a whole chapter in the WHO, though, which, you know, the U.S. just pulled its funding for last night. Um, so I don't think we're going in that direction. That being said, I do think we're going to end up having to have um, an increase in SDR. So I would actually give that quite a big probability. I'll finish there. Okay, great. Adam. Another batch of fascinating questions and time running very short. Um, I agree with Dame Julius that this question of, as it were, what kind of a crisis this is, how deep it's going to be, is absolutely fundamental to all subsequent assessments that we make. I, I would just go with Megan. I liked her image of the, the airplane with no motors. Um, it, it's difficult to exaggerate, I think, how comprehensive this shutdown is and how dramatic its impact is. Um, and I don't think we really know very well what happens when you try and put that back together and restart it. And I think, especially speaking from the US point of view, it's important to emphasize just how catastrophic the social crisis feels in the United States right now. I mean, I come back to that Michigan number, a quarter of the workforce unemployed in a single month. These are middle class people with bills to pay, with car loans, queuing up in bread lines. The sense of the retreat, if you like, of economic viability and stability in the US is massive. And under those circumstances, it's, it's very important, I think, for the, to have that kind of all hands on deck approach. Um, whether it will last going forward, that brings us back to the question of social inequality. But I think it's quite difficult sometimes to communicate across the Atlantic just how um, a 1930s style this is beginning to feel in certain parts of the US. And the imagery is, is really utterly shocking. It would be great if that's not how this goes forward, but it doesn't seem an unrealistic prospect at this moment. On global leadership and coordination, there are after all two stories about that in 2008. And one is the G20 London a good moment, if you like. But of course, the thing that somebody from my political persuasion is haunted by is what happened in 2010. In other words, the, the mechanism for cooperation in the G20 also became a device for the concerted application, basically, of what turned out to be completely wrong-headed ideas about fiscal consolidation. So coordination is good, but it depends very much on what the agenda is that's being pursued. And I worry, frankly, about the longer-term implications. Um, uh, and this, this is where I think some of the action will be played out. Uh, in the consolidation phase will be critical to the, the impact of this crisis. On SDRs, you know, it's been, it's been a, a story, a game of, uh, of many parts so far. The, the, the Trump administration's relationship with the IMF is to be, seems to be in flux since the beginning of the year. We know there was the big shock with David Lipton's departure. On the other hand, then the 27th of March decision to actually cooperate with the refunding of the IMF. Many, I think some analysts were quite surprised by how little economic nationalism and the uncooperative attitude of the Trump administration had so far impacted on crisis fighting. It seems this week is the moment where the chickens come home to roost. And so I, I think a question that we've not explicitly, a point we've not explicitly made, but, but a lot hangs on the outcome of the election in the fall. What kind of administration goes forward? How the State Department is rebuilt after this? How Treasury is rebuilt after this? And what the complexion of the congressional power balance is? Because we know how uncooperative the GOP and Congress was towards uh, Obama administration efforts to deliver on the G20 London promises to reform the structure of the IMF. That's all to play for at this point. And we are beginning to see the uglier faces of that uh, uh, Trumpian unilateralism and nationalism showing itself this week. And it, it's a very dismaying sight and obviously at a very bad moment. Maybe they can bury a, te bury a technical fix like the SDR under the woodwork, but clearly the WT WHO now is one of the chosen victims of Trumpian politics. So I think that's all to play for and a lot does hinge on the big picture politics of November. Thank you. I'm very glad, um, Adam, that you have raised the question of November. It's clearly an incredibly important one and consequential one. And it's very difficult to have a conversation about international cooperation and coordination in the context of a US government that's being led by um, this White House. But we all know that there are multiple other stories of cooperation across state borders amongst scientists, amongst epidemiologists, amongst people across the health community working on this crisis, not least economists. So there's, there's a lot of good there, but unfortunately without the center, 
um, there, you know, there's a big elephant in the room and we all, we all know um, what that is. Uh, I have to say thank you so much to Megan, to Adam. It's been extraordinary, not only for giving us your time, but also uh, very importantly for giving us your writings because um, really it's, uh, it's tremendously informative. If you don't already follow them, follow them, read their books, read their writings come back and continue to talk with us on Twitter in person. Um, I think we should definitely have a round two. Unfortunately, I think this is gonna run for a little while, but thank you so much. And we can't really clap, but uh, <laughs> we really do appreciate it. So thank you so much. Cheers, been a thank pleasure. You. Have a great day and stay healthy. Yes, likewise.